Hello everyone, thank you for joining our webinar today. My name is Justin Warner and I will be moderating today's webinar. I am pleased to be joined by the CEO of DecisionWise and author of the new book, Engagement Magic, Five Keys for Engaging People, Leaders, and Organizations, Dr. Tracy Maylett. Thanks Thanks. for the opportunity. It's great to be here. Yeah, we're glad to have you. We're glad that you're with us today. We welcome your questions. You're able to put questions and comments in uh, in the chat box. And as we are able to get to the questions, we will do our best to do so. And um, anyway, Tracy, let's go ahead and, uh, and kick off today's webinar. Um, as I mentioned in the intro, I recently released a book, uh, Engagement Magic, and, and those five keys for engaging people, leaders, and organizations. Let's talk a little bit about how uh, the book fits in with the other books that, we, that we've written on employee engagement and employee experience. Great. Thanks, Justin. I appreciate that very much. Uh, back in two, 2014, we wrote our first book, and this book was dealing, it was called Magic. And Magic was based on about 14 million survey responses. So with DecisionWise, we conducted surveys over a period of time. And from those responses, we asked ourselves the question, what does create engagement in an organization or an individual? And we found some very, very interesting things as we released that book. That book was a, was a great bestseller. Uh, it was an award winner, and I think one of the biggest reasons for that was simply the fact that it did resonate with people at the mm-hmm. time. For sure. Yeah, no question about it. So from that, we asked ourselves another question, and that was really, okay, so now that we have an understanding of what does create engagement and what engagement mm-hmm. is within an organization, how does that impact us externally? And we released another book at that time. That book was called The Employee Experience. And with The Employee Experience, we... Um, took a look at this and said, what impact does does the employee experience have on someone's engagement? Uh, those terms were often used interchangeably, uh, employee experience and employee engagement. And we realized that they're actually not the same thing. Engagement is a subset of the employee experience. And when we released the employee experience within um, within two week period of time, that book was topping the charts on Amazon. And we felt very good about that as well as it was the actual number one bestseller on Barnes and Noble. We realized at that time, this is a hot topic. I mean, we've learned about customer experience. Customer experience has been something we've been focusing on for oh, 10 years now. Mm-hmm. And what's starting to happen is we're now focusing on the employee experience. That book was released uh, about this time uh, last year, 2017 in January. And it was, it was an interesting um, to see the, the, the great following that was there because it really did tell people that there is something serious about the employee experience and customer experience. And so we wanted to follow up on that. Over this past year or so, one of the things that we've been doing is focusing on the idea of, first of all, we've added a lot to our database. Mm-hmm. So from that 14 million survey responses, we've more than doubled that. So we're now at somewhere in the neighborhood of about 32 million survey responses. What that did was reinforce what we already knew, but in in a different way. It also gave us some additional information. And so what I'd like to do today is talk a little bit about what some of those things are. Uh, Four or five key learning points that we've learned over the last four or five years. Yeah, and I think, Tracy, that's critical to why why the new book, right? There there are things that we're just not stagnant in the way of of our thinking. That um, There are new things that are coming out, and as we continue to evolve... These are the ideas. And so that's, yeah. that's where we want to focus in, uh, is on these key ideas right now. Particularly in today's hiring environment, you know, when we have more jobs open than we have employees available to fill those, particularly in the United States, but it also goes to other parts of the world as well. Uh, we're kind of entering what we refer to as the age of the employee. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about some of these findings that uh, we've realized over the last little while. The first finding is this that engagement clearly impacts the success of an organization. As we wrote the employee experience, one of the things we found without a doubt is that we have this concept called EX. All right, so when you when you see these ideas of CX or the customer experience, one of the things we're often forgetting is we've fallen in love with this idea of brand, right? The the CX brand. What is our brand bringing to the customer experience? What do they see because of that? Well, in our in our zeal for discovering what this is, we've often forgot what we refer to as the, the employee brand, okay? The employer brand in particular, which is what does our brand say about who we are as, an, as a company? 
And there's been very, very clear evidence, and we present a lot of this in, in the, the employee experience, the concept that EX equals CX. So if I have an amazing employee experience, I'm likely to give that amazing employee experience also to the customers that I work with. So we use this, this equation, EX equals CX. Yeah, that's, it's, it's really powerful. In fact, I was on a call this morning with, uh, with a, a partner, and, and they, were, they help organizations with business strategy. And they said, over the years, we've only focused on processes and procedures, and we need help with employees. We now understand that EX equals CX, and they were reaching out to DecisionWise to help them with that. And, and it truly is, in the age of the employee, what we can do with our employees will impact every other part of our business. And if we can create a positive experience there then and create that magic, as we allude to, then that, that really adds value for the organization as a whole and our end-use customers. Oh, well, there's no question about that. You know, in I, rightly so, organizations are investing currently um, billions of dollars in, in CX. Mm-hmm. How do I make sure that my CX, uh, my customer experience, is reflective of what we want it to be. We know that CX, if they have a delightful customer experience, they're going to be able to invest more in, in our company, right? So they, they'll buy what we're offering in our services. Um, that, that may be retail, that may be education, that may be government, whatever that is. But when they have a delightful customer experience, they're much more likely to invest themselves in that organization. But what we've also found really clearly is that uh, as organizations attack this CX, this customer experience, they're forgetting the thing that drives the customer experience, which is the employee experience. If I have a lousy employee experience, it's going to be reflected on that person that I deal with next. Mm-hmm. We can all think of ex- times that we've gone to, uh, say, a retail store, and our experience has been very poor. Well, what would happen is typically we'd receive an, a survey about our, our customer experience, and it would mention nothing really about the employee experience. But I can almost bet you that the reason why I had that bad customer experience was because that employee was having a bad uh, employee experience. Yeah, it's it's really neat. I've tried uh, the last little while when I've had a positive customer experience that I want to tweet out to that company that I've had a, a positive customer experience because of that employee yes. and the, the experience that that employee was having as well. So one of our key learning points was exactly that. It is, if you have an organization that is engaged, uh, and I'm going to talk about what engagement really is here in just a second, because that was one of the key findings from from this book. But when you have an organization that's engaged, you're likely to experience a very, very solid customer experience. So we see all of these figures that are out there, right? Every And I, I mention this in, in podcasts that we do and also the webinars, that most of these start off, most HR conferences start off with a statistic, something like, you know, 78% of your employees are disengaged in their jobs. When we wrote the original book back in 2014, we questioned this idea. Because think about it this way, common sense. I have to walk past six people in my organization before I really find somebody who's engaged in their job. It should be easy to fire those six and just get them done with the, mm-hmm. with the one person out of the seven. Um, so one of the things that we looked at very clearly in this was what really is engagement? What is the state of engagement today? And we actually found, and this was again reinforced in this iteration, that 32% of employees, wherever you go, and this was uh, how many countries? 70 countries? 70 countries. 70 countries. Um, in uh, looking at these 70 countries and saying what really does create engagement, we actually found that 32% of these individuals are fully engaged in their jobs, not just marginally engaged. Um, Our key contributor group, which is about half of the population, 48% were engaged in their jobs. So when you add those two numbers together, you start to realize that 80% of the population really is engaged. Think of it this way. When was the last time you showed up for work and said, I sure hope today is an awful day? You just, you just don't. It's not what you want. You don't show up to this <laughs> webinar and say, I hope this webinar is boring. This is not human nature. Human nature is we want to engage. And 80% of the population really is engaged in what they do. But we also have this other 20%. 16% of that comes from what we refer to as the opportunity group or waiting to engage. This is, if this were a voting year, this is kind of our swing vote. These are the people who could go either way, and they do. As we track them year to year in employee surveys, we find that they have, they shift into other groups. 
Then we have this last group. This is our fully disengaged. Now, fully disengaged doesn't mean I have a bad day once in a while. It means I am truly disengaged in my job. Mm -hmm. I hate my job. Yeah. I have no desire to be here. In fact, sabotage occurs, whether that's active sabotage, meaning I intentionally do something, or passive sabotage, such as I, I let uh, quality defects go or something like this. But we find that very, very clearly, again, 80% of the organization is somewhat engaged in their roles. Yeah. Now, take that 80% and look at the other 20%. That other 20% is creating likely a poor customer experience in whatever they're doing. Yeah. And I think a couple of things to, to take from that is that um, the key contributor group, while they are engaged, one of the things we can build on is in, is that strength. We can build upon that already engaged spirit that they have and help them become even more engaged. And those that are sitting on the fence, they're either waiting to either learn how to become engaged or need to make that choice. That's and right. we can help them with that. And I know that that's some of the things that we talk about uh, later on, but it's really important that we we recognize that this this gives us a paints a picture of um, of really creating and building an engaged uh, ing engaged workforce. And it's something that we can build. It's not something that we're just all of a sudden born with and good luck, here you go. Yeah, exactly right. And we're gonna talk more about this in just a moment, but going back to that statistic that we saw, you know, uh, six out of seven or seven, eight, seven out of eight of your employees are disengaged in their job. And we see this with other organizations that have conducted employee surveys, um, whether those be polls or whatever, and we asked the question, how can they be so radically different? In fact, we've had some questions come in already from the webinar. How is our information so radically different from what we see in these other organizations? The answer to that one is in the way that it's measured. So think of it this way. If um, I actually had a, uh, a cardiologist tell me this one time as we went through and talked about, about his employee survey results, um, he was going through a massive amount of change in the organization. They had just huge upheaval, uh, restructuring all kinds of things, and we conducted the employee survey during that period of time. And we found that there were quite a number of disengaged employees at that particular time. Um, although there weren't seven out of eight that were disengaged, and he said to me something that really hit me very strongly, and that was, this is, this is like um, I'm, I have a patient on a table, and I have that patient, and I'm waking that patient up as I'm performing open heart surgery, and I have my hand on their heart and saying, so how you feeling right now? <laughs> you feeling pretty good right now? And he said, that's what it's like. If you take a snapshot in time, all of us are going to have these bad days. Right? So all of us, there's not, a, even my job, I absolutely love my job, but there are aspects about my job that I don't necessarily love. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't enjoy hopping on an airplane and flying for seven hours. I love what happens when I get there. But that flight is not something I love. So there are aspects of our job that we don't necessarily like. That doesn't mean I'm disengaged in my job. Yeah. And when these other organizations conduct these polls, it's often binary, meaning your engagement e is either on or off. You're either engaged or feeling that 100% of the time, or you're not. It's one or the other. And that's one of the reasons why we see that you know, employees truly are engaged um, most of the time, and we look at the long-term effect that's yeah. there. And just maybe a little additional color on that. Um, if it is binary, if you look at the, the top line, um, other companies might look at that fully engaged, and that's what they say is engaged. Everybody else is disengaged exactly or not right. engaged. And so when it, um, but decision-wise, we take a different approach. What Tracy just alluded to is that there are different levels of engagement. It isn't a binary, you are or you aren't. Um, some of those other measurements that are out there, you're engaged or you're not engaged. And exactly so. right. Take, take a, this into consideration. You have about 50% of your population, 48% to be exact, that really are your key contributors. These are your strong and steady performers in the organization. Are they fully showing engagement 100% of the time? The answer is no, because very rarely do we always, 100% of our time, feel this sense of engagement in whatever we do. Now, that doesn't mean they're disengaged in their jobs. They are very engaged in their jobs, but that dis, that uh, there, there are parts of their job they don't necessarily enjoy. Mm -hmm. And there's there, room for improvement. There's room for improvement. There <laughs> still are strong and steady yeah. performers, and not for a second would we want them to leave the organization. Correct. Yeah. Let's look at the next point. So we have our next point here. That uh, The first point, again, was that engagement clearly impacts the success of the organization. But this one is we learned what engagement really is and what creates it. 
So again, going back to the idea is how can our numbers be different than other numbers that are out there? Uh, this is one of the big things. Over the last five years, we've we found that engagement has a different definition. So let me take you back to my um, days of driver's education. So I was 15, and uh, we're, we're living in Utah. Utah, you drive at the age of 16. And uh, we go through this, this uh, driver's education program. And it was back in the day when everyone learned on uh, a manual shift, right? So it was... It was, we didn't, we had a stick shift we had to learn on. And one of the first questions that my driver's ed instructor asked, he asked the question, what is the purpose of the clutch in an automobile, a clutch? And nobody really could give an answer until one of the, one of the young men that was in the class there raised his hand. He said, it engages and disengages the engine so something can happen. And that was a long time ago. I won't tell you how many years ago, but that was when I was 16. And that has still hit me when we talk about what engagement is. Engagement actually causes something to happen. Mm -hmm. And our definition over time, and I don't know how this happened, but our definition has warped to where we think now engagement is a feeling, right? And to, to, to quote my favorite group, Boston, it's more than a feeling, right? <laughs> it, engagement does mean something different than just feeling something. It actually means we do something. So that same idea of the clutch. Engagement, it, a clutch engages and disengages an engine so that something happens. That's what we need to look at engagement. Engagement is more than just a feeling. It involves acting as well. And so one of the things we've learned over the last four or five years is that People can feel something without actually doing something. So I appreciate a lot of the work that has been done on things such as happiness over the last little while. I'm a big fan of the, the happiness movement, the idea that we should be happy in our lives, in our work, and things like this. But it is very possible to be happy and not actually doing anything about it. Mm -hmm. So I have to ask you the question. In your organization, would you rather have a bunch of happy people or a bunch of people who are actually doing something? Well, happiness always leads, hopefully leads to actually doing something, but not always. So what we're trying to measure in engagement is not just how are you feeling, it is what are you actually doing about yeah, that. The combination of the two. Exactly right. Yeah. So we say engagement, this is how we define engagement, this is the definition we've stuck by for the last number of years, and that is employee engagement is an emotional state where we feel passionate, energetic, and committed to our work. So what this means is this. Um, first of all, we look at four components. The first component is the heart. Okay, so we fully invest our best selves, our hearts. So, Justin, to you, what does heart represent? Um, well, that's the feeling. That's I want to exactly. I want to dive in, and I want I want it to be the passion that I feel. Exactly right. Yeah. You bring that love to your job. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we fully invest our best selves. We have that heart that's there. The next part is also a piece of that, and that is that passion, that drive, that spirit. You know, you, uh, we refer to team spirit. Spirit. So I am a Utah Jazz fan because we live in Utah. You kind of have to do that, right? So I'm a Utah Jazz fan, and you can walk into that, and you can immediately feel this team spirit that's there. The fans are loud. It's a very, very loud um, arena, and you, you feel that. Well, the same thing happens in an organization. I can walk into a team and within about 15 minutes tell you whether or not that, that team is operating with a sense yeah, of passion. For there. sure. Very palpable. So, so both of those, as you mentioned, are the feeling piece of the equation. Mm -hmm. So how do I feel? But feeling is not enough. Engagement actually means so something can happen, right? So the engine is engaged so that something actually happens. I can move forward. I can go in reverse, whatever that is. So here's where we actually start doing. This is the mind. So when we talk about bringing our minds to our work, what that means is I'm actually thinking about my job. This is where innovation comes from, creativity. If I see, suppose I'm working on the assembly line, if I see a defective part come through or a piece of equipment that needs to be redesigned, I'm thinking this through in my mind. That's a sign of engagement. Something's actually happening. And then finally, the last part of that, my hands. So when I say hands, what do you Yeah, that's you think the ultimate of? doing, right? It is. So I get it out of my mind and I, I, I see it, I fix it, I do it, right? Exactly right. So as you see on the left-hand side, we have the feeling piece of it, right? So how do I feel? What, what, what does that make me feel to, to come to work every day? Do I love my job? And then on the other side of that equation, you say, yeah, but what do I actually do about that? Mm -hmm. 
That's something that I think is different from a lot of the engagement theory that we see today, where engagement really is that emotional state where we feel something. We're saying, yeah, that's great, but that doesn't help me as an organization unless that's translated into action. Yeah. So that was one of the other findings uh, in terms of engagement. So what creates that was one of the big pieces. Okay, Engagement involves both feeling and making something happen. So what, does, what relates to that feeling that translates then into the making something happen? And that's the basis of this next book. Uh, it was We had some kernels of that in our first book, Magic. Now with engagement magic, what we're talking about is what of that feeling, first of all, how is that generated? And then second, what, how do we translate that and make that action? And it really takes a focus not just at the organizational level, but at those different components, the team, the individual, and the organization, right? And so that it's important that we don't just focus on one area, that there are, er there are reasons to focus in specific, with specific people, with specific areas, because engagement, like any other movement, could be grassroots. It doesn't have to be top down. So there are lots of ways that, that you can approach it. Um, you can build on people's strengths. So those who have a, a strength towards engagement, you'd want to build upon that. Those who might be lacking in it, you can build upon that. And I think that's what I love about the magic framework is, and as we measure organizations and where they fall in this magic framework, framework is that um, we can identify where are those strengths and where are those opportunities. What can exactly. we build on and what can we, where, where can we help people improve? Perfect. Very, very good. As we did this back in 2014, one of the, the areas that we found was that really there are five keys to engagement. And as we went through those keys, we actually found that there were six keys and then we found that there were four keys. <laughs> and then we went back through it again and again and again, and we found that, first of all, two of these keys related to each other. And I'll explain that here in just a moment. But they were separate enough that they needed to be included separately. And we came up with this concept, um, and I believe we started with, with impact, you know, making a difference. Yeah. We said that impact is one of the key drivers. And then we said, yeah, but people need connection. They need to be connected to something. And we came up with this, and we found that there were five. And fortuitously, really, this was not a branding exercise, but we realized if we rearrange these, these actually form an acronym that we can remember and that we can teach managers within an organization so that they can be aware of these and individuals as well. And that's where the MAGIC acronym came up. MAGIC is actually an acronym that stands for Meaning, Autonomy, Growth, Impact, and Connection. And if it's okay with you, I'd like to talk about each Let's one see. of these yeah. concepts. So the first one that we talk about is Meaning. So meaning is, is um, something where we find that our work has purpose beyond the job itself. Yeah, so I think for me, this is, this is an area that's really, really important. And I, I know that as we go into organizations, we, we find some where this, this is really, really high and some it, it tends to be a little bit yeah. lower. And as you mentioned, this one correlates to, to other areas within the organization. But what does the purpose, the vision, the mission, what does that mean to me as, as an employee? And, uh, and, and how can I make what we do as an organization mean something to me? Um, it, it really is the catalyst for some of those feelings that we talked about is if I want to feel, um, feel engaged, feel the, those, those parts of feeling, right. I have to have that sense of meaning so that then I can act on it. Perfect. Thank you. You know, and this is very, this was surprising to us because we researched and it's rewritten about it in the book, some purpose-driven organizations. These are organizations that truly in themselves exist for a purpose. Mm -hmm. So this may be a healthcare organization. We exist to save lives or improve health. This could be um, an area an organization that exists to provide clothing to um, poverty-stricken nations. Mm -hmm. So these are, or that builds homes for people yeah. who need those. These inherently have some type of meaning in them. So we figured that these organizations, because of the inherent meaning that was in the organization, would tend to have more engaged employees than those who in other organizations that say, we're working on an assembly line. What we really found was that engagement um, in terms of meaning was very individual. So I could work for a very purpose-driven organization, yet not find purpose in my life. Yeah. And I could work on the assembly line, assembling widgets all day long, and find great purpose in what I did. Yeah. So very, very interesting. But the concept is there. We'll, I'll talk more about this in 
kind of give you a hint here. One of the things that we found in this round was that engagement is very much a 50-50 proposition, yeah. meaning the organization can provide 50% of that, but I own 50% of that as well. And that's critical with the mission part. Yes, or, and, excuse me, and with the meaning that you have to you have to want to be there. You have to feel that um, desire and whatnot in order to, to make this work. Part of that 50% as I as the employee, I've got to be, be working toward that. We find actually that meaning has two different pieces. We refer to this as direct meaning and associated mm-hmm. meaning or direct or inherent meaning. So direct or inherent meaning is when the job itself creates a sense of purpose. So I may be a pediatrician. The job itself creates a sense of purpose for me. I'm working with children, saving lives, helping them improve their health, right? So the job itself may have some meaning. Mm -hmm. But even in those types of jobs, we find that people don't find meaning in those jobs. There's another part of meaning that we refer to as associated meaning. Associated meaning is maybe the job itself does not provide purpose, but what that job allows me to do provides purpose. Yeah. So I may be um, installing cars on an automobile or tires on an automobile. And day to day, I may not necessarily find purpose in that until I realize that number one, I am making this automobile safe, but even more importantly for me, I am earning a living so that I can put my daughter through college. Yeah. I now all of a sudden have meaning, have meaning in my job. There's yeah. a reason why we do yeah. this. So that's the first key, meaning in my job. As we've gone from the first iteration to this iteration, one of the things we do in this book is provide more case studies about that and more evidence to support where meaning actually comes from and why that exists. Great. So let's talk a little bit uh, autonomy. You know yep. you know this is one of my favorite ones. That's right. <laughs> He's had to work with me for a while. So <laughs> autonomy is extremely important to me. And this is this is, you know, I know that there are different levels of autonomy that we can have. Autonomy is not anarchy, letting people do whatever, right. but within the confines of what uh, what our organization is able to do, how can individuals feel autonomous? And uh, and that's really important in, in certain individuals. Some individuals, it's less important. Um, someone like me, I find great strength in that autonomy because then that gets the juices flowing for other things Good. as well. So um, autonomy definitely resonates with me. <laughs> This is one of our key points here at DecisionWise. So I'll use us as an example, and there are some other areas that we still need to work on. But autonomy is one of those areas that we've had a lot of discussion about, and we intentionally said we're going to create an, an organization where people have autonomy and where they flourish in that type of environment. So one of the things that we do is we actually hire for autonomy. We've identified that autonomy is big to what we do. We hire people who can act autonomously. Um, Autonomy is not pure chaos, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. It's not anarchy. In fact, one of the things that we talk about in the employee experience is that you have to create a framework. So picture a field. And with that field, you have fences. So one of the responsibilities of the organization is to clearly define those fences. You Here's inside the fence. Here's outside the fence. Inside that fence, you, employee, do anything that you want to. Um, Just... Do it, make sure it's legal, make sure it's ethical, (laughs) make sure it adds to the business, but you're on, this is yours, but you don't step outside of that fence. That's really what autonomy is, and we need to be able to set those boundaries very clearly, Mm -hmm. but then let employees act within that. Um, I'm a big jazz fan, not just the team, as I mentioned before, but actually the musical genre. The music, now you get both. (laughs) Now you get both, that's maybe one of the reasons why I like the jazz. Um, I'm a big jazz fan, and one of the reasons that is is because jazz... And a lot of music provides a structure. So you have a key signature. Mm -hmm. You have time that you need to operate within. You have certain phrasing and things like this that you have to operate within. But you're free to improvise within that. And that's what autonomy is all about. It's the power to shape your work and environment in ways that allow you to perform at your best. I think next time we're going to get you to come in and play some music for us. Yeah, I don't know that we'd have many (laughs) participants on that. (laughs) Let's talk about the next one. Next one is growth. Growth is being stretched and challenged in ways that result in personal and professional progress. Yeah, Tracy, we see this one a lot with organizations um, because people don't 
understand what growth opportunities are there sure. for them. They, so many people associate growth with promotion. And so this is a very common one we see on surveys that comes back low because of that disconnect of what, what really are those growth opportunities that organizations may be providing. And they might not be connecting the dots. Or if, if they are doing them, they're not connecting the dots. Or if they're not doing them, how do they help their employees understand that this is how they grow yeah. as a person or an employee? So now, here's something interesting that we found through our research. There are far more jobs open right now, right? And f there are less people to fill those jobs. So we can, I, I as an employee have the ability to go find another job somewhere else, right? Despite the fact that there are more jobs open, there are actually less position advancements opportun advancement mm. opportunities than there used to be. So if I'm in a job, yes, there are more jobs available even within my company, but now to move from junior assistant to the regional manager to assistant to the regional manager um, and title change, those become much less frequent than they mm -hmm. used to be. So we need to be careful that we don't necessarily associate growth with that promotion or difference yeah. in title. We are finding very clearly, and there's a lot of other research to support this, that millennials will leave a job faster. It's, it's actually not meaning it is growth, growth. for growth opportunities. Yeah. Those growth opportunities don't necessarily mean an advancement in title from developer to senior developer. What they do mean is an opportunity to focus on something different that causes me to stretch and grow in a way that I wasn't being stretched and, and was able to grow in the in previous opportunities. Yeah. So growth is our next one. Uh, now, beyond growth, we now have meaning, autonomy, growth. The next one is impact. Impact is seeing positive and worthwhile outcomes and results from your work. I'll just talk a little bit about a story that we found as we wrote this, this next edition. Um, I was presenting on the concept of the, the MAGIC acronym and engagement MAGIC at an organization for about 450 employees. And we did two sessions, uh, 450 employees each, and this was in a healthcare organization. So we were talking about the concept of impact and making a difference, feeling like there were re real results. And there was a, a head nurse that was there, and it was, again, a hospital. And she said, she stood up and raised, the, raised her hand and said, it's, it's easy to understand how you can have impact in a job like a nurse. I see the results of what I'm doing every single day. But what about, say, housekeeping in a hospital? Or what about dietary, where you don't necessarily see the impact of what's going on? And I was thinking about that for just a second and didn't have to think about it very long because there was a woman in the back, far back, remember this is 450 people, and she stood up and you could tell the people around her were just wondering what she was about to say. <laughs> she, they must have known her very well. And she said, let me tell you about impact. She said, I was working, I have been working at this organization for the past 10 years. I work in dietary. That means that my job is to bring patients their meals every day and their families, and I do that three times a day. And she said, now, you doctors and you nurses, you go in and you talk to the patient, and you're there with them for about three minutes, and that's it. And you, during that time, you're giving them bad news. This isn't the, the best time in their lives, obviously. The patients aren't at their best. And I go in, after you've been there, and it was it, you can tell jaws were dropping, what's she about to say? And she says, I provide them and their family some of the only joy they've received that day. I provide them a warm meal, and it may be the first warm meal they've received for a long time. And I talk to their families, and I talk to them as individuals. As individuals, not as patients. I talk to them as people. She said, that's impact. Yeah. And she sat down, and everyone else in that room, all 449 other people, stood up and gave her a standing ovation and clapped because she understood what impact was in her job. That's such a great story. Such a great story. Impact, seeing positive and worthwhile outcomes and results from your work. All right, the last one. So connection, when we talk about connection, you know, we have different levels of connection within the organization. So how do we connect with um, other employees, our peers, our coworkers? Uh, how do we connect to um, the organization as a whole, to our customers? There's different levels where connection right. can exist. And I think that that's important for um, individuals to understand that I can't just connect with one person in the organization. That, that's good. You know, I can have a best friend at work, but it's important that my connection it, it expands beyond just one other person, for example. I'm glad that you brought that up because that's another difference in the way we're measuring things. I love that question. 
you have a best friend at work, it's very, very clear that there, uh, there's a clear tie between whether I'm engaged and whether or not I enjoy the people I work with. No question about that. But connection doesn't always happen on the individual one-to-one personal mm-hmm. level. Uh, I don't necessarily have to come to work every day because I love the people that I work with. Now, by the way, that is always the highest scoring category. I like working with my teamwork, Mm -hmm. teammates. But it may be a connection to something different. Picture Disney, for example. Uh, If I work for Disney, I am a Disney cast member. I connect to the mission and values of the organization. That's a type of connection. Connection really is the key that you mentioned is belonging. And that, that belonging happens in different ways. I feel like I'm a part of something bigger than just myself. Great. That's connection. Okay, so let's go to the next one. One of the next findings that was very, very important was this concept that engagement is a competency. This is new, this concept. Um, And when you think of engagement being two parts, both feeling and doing, now we start to address the doing part. This is one of the big sections that we've added to this new book is the concept that engagement is a competency. So let's talk about this concept that we call engaging people. This is our tagline. So engaging people is this. It can be used both, it has a double meaning here, uh, double entendre which is that we have an adjective. So engaging means drawing favorable interest. So it's actually something that's, that is a description of me. Mm-hmm. So Justin, I, I know you, you are an engaging individual. You draw people towards you. That's just who you are. So there's that piece. And because you draw people together, you're, you're actually able to get them to act on that, which is the second part of this, the verb. That's where you feel passionate, energetic about your work. So you dedicate your mind and your hand as well. You're, you're actually causing something to happen. So when we talk about engagement, I'd like to kind of change that word to engaging because it does have that double meaning that's yeah. very, very important. With, along with that means that engagement is a competency. Now, when you think about competencies in human resources or learning and development, it means that it's something that we're able to do, a skill that we have, a, a, an ability to make something happen. Well, engagement, we have found, is actually something that can be learned. It can be taught. We can measure it. Um, it is something we can hold people accountable for as well. So that manager, you know, you're you're my manager here. I can actually should be able to expect to hold you accountable for engaging. Correct. Not only engaging yourself, but engaging other people. And this well. is one of those things, Tracy, that over the past four or five months as I've been out talking to people about this, it really resonates. Um, I think we've, we've, we've captured what HR professionals have been feeling for a long time. That, you know, I can't just have people sitting around waiting right. to become engaged. This is something that we have to both learn and choose and develop. And understanding that engagement is a development process changes our focus. That I'm just not, I'm going to quit throwing things at them to make them become engaged. But now I'm going to help them become engaged. Exactly And, right. and it's this process of becoming like we would with any other training, learning, and development. Take this right back to the growth opportunities. If we're teaching them how to become engaged in their work, whether they're with us or some other organization, they're going to have a far better experience because they know how to become engaged in those organizations. Perfect. I like that. In fact, we even talked about the title, uh, Waiting to Engage, and we thought it sounded like a bad Tom Hanks <laughs> bad Tom Hanks movie, so we decided against that. But the idea here is right. We, we as individuals... We need to engage ourselves, and we'll talk about that here in just a second. This book talks about two or three organizations that actually hold their managers accountable for engaging, Mm -hmm. meaning that they hold them accountable to be engaged themselves, but also for their team. Uh, We have several organizations that we work with that, as they conduct their employee surveys, if that manager's group falls within the bottom quartile of all engagement scores, they'll work with that individual for a year to help create an engaging environment for him or her as well as the team. If it happens in year two, then they're sitting down and having a serious discussion. They're actually willing to let anyone in the organization go, meaning terminate their employment, if that engagement is not there on multiple levels. Which brings up the next point. Uh, One of our other learnings that engagement must be addressed on three different levels. Okay, this is a big one. Now, we work with many, many organizations. So we work with hundreds of organizations a year. Most of those we we work with again year in, year out. So some of these we've been working with for well over a decade. And the CEO comes back to us and says, you know, I'm doing all these great things. We as an organization are rolling out all of these things, but our engagement isn't really budging a whole lot. It it changed. It's great. We're up, you know, five or 10 points. 
But over this period of time, it stopped. It stalled. What's going on? And we look at this and say, well, there's an issue here. You don't understand this concept that engaging people really occurs at three different levels. One is the organization. So you, CEO, are doing some great things as an organization to create an engaging culture. People choose to be part of this organization. But there are other two levels that you're missing. The second level is the team level or the manager level, right? Are you willing to hold your managers accountable for engaging? And most of them hadn't even thought of that idea. And then I asked the question, what about individuals? Are you willing to hold individuals such as leaders or even individual employees accountable for engaging as well? And they're almost stupefied. They haven't really thought about that because they've tried to push engagement through the only button which they know, which is that here are the eight things that we need to do at the first of the year to create mm-hmm. a culture of engagement. Yep. Yeah, and, and again, this really resonates with people as, we, as I've had the chance to talk through this with other organizations, you know, that each one of those different groups has unique ways that they can build engagement throughout. Um, and again, that, grass, that grassroots effort. If I as an individual choose and, and learn to become engaged yeah. and my team does the same and I have several teams of engagement, now I'm going to have a, a more engaged envir- uh, environment in my organization. But it is critical for the organization to create that environment where this can exist and Perfect. this can flourish. Very good. So we had a, uh, a couple of questions asked and I'm just going to hit one of these questions as we answer this because I think it's the right place to do that. The question is, would you focus more on the 80% engaged employees or on the 20% not engaged? The answer to that question is, let me give you some more statistics here in just a moment, but you'll soon find that those who are truly disengaged in what they do very rarely will engage in this organization or even the next organization. So the reason I mention that is because these 80% engaged employees, I can work with these folks. The 16% of people who are on the on the edge right there, uh, yeah, if I create the right environment, they can happen, but understand that engagement is a choice. And those 4% who are disengaged will very rarely choose to engage. So if I try to tackle engagement only at the organizational level, I can do certain things. So this is me as a CEO. I'm sitting here saying, I received my employee survey results back. I realize that there's some disengagement in my organization. There's some issues I need to address. So senior team, let's get together and let's figure this out. We'll... um, create this document that says, here are the four things we're going to do this year to create engagement. We're going to release this to everybody else and things will change and they'll be engaged. That, Justin's the typical process. Mm -hmm. That's what most organizations do. Well, that's fantastic. Good. Glad they're making some actions. You know, they've increased autonomy. Good. They've helped with growth. The problem with that is they're not looking at the other levels. So we refer to what we call the uh, maturity continuum, engagement maturity continuum. And it looks like this as we work with our clients, and we talk about this in the book as well. There are actually five stages of to understand how mature your organization is when it comes to engagement. The first stage is what we refer to as measurement. Measurement really means that engagement is, a, in our organization, about measuring. So if I'm conducting an employee survey, I'm doing something about engagement, but all I'm really doing is measure that. Now, what percentage of organizations would you guess were in this phase? Th- um, that's what they do is measure. Yeah, that's the majority. I, I would say the percentage. majority of organizations that we initially start working with are either at the measurement or below. Yeah, it <laughs> so. is. So we actually have a, a sub-zero <laughs> level here as well, which is we don't do anything about engagement. Yeah. At least these folks are looking at engagement and saying, well, let's measure it to see what's going on. That's the stage we refer to in the maturity continuum as the measurement stage. Okay, when people are in the measurement stage, just the fact that they've asked the question, we see that engagement increases Absolutely. because employees are saying, oh, they're actually asking me something about it. Yeah. Now, if I don't do anything about those results, those it's results worse. plummet again. <laughs> exactly yeah. right. The next stage as an organization looks like this. Engagement is not just a survey, but it's, it's owned by human resources. Human resources says, no, we're going to do something about it. And the organization has made a stated commitment, although that commitment's limited. You know, they're saying engagement is important to us. We're going to start measuring it and looking at it. HR takes over and says, we're going to do some things about it. And we find a lot of organizations are in this commitment stage. We're committed to this, but committed is a lot different than acting. Mm -hmm. This next phase, 
Justin, you want to talk a little bit about this phase because this yeah. is where we find a lot of organizations fall between two and three. Yeah, I think this is uh, this is really important because this is where we see the shift. If we were to put a line there, uh, this is where we see a, a shift in that jump where engagement now becomes part of the organization, right? Where we shift that focus from an HR initiative to a strategic business yes. initiative. And so it's really, it really is we've made, we've, we've crossed the, the, the hill, if yes. you will, yeah, in exactly. that. And a lot of HR people feel that this validates what they've been working on and trying to get that, look, this part of engagement impacts every part of your business. Right. And, and when managers and management feel that and recognize that, this is when it gets at that management level and beyond and uh, and really steamrolls, you know, the Jim Collins flywheel, right? right. This is where that, that starts to take place. This is, you're exactly right. This is where that shift moves from. Remember, in the measurement stage, it's surveying, mm -hmm. it's measuring it. In the commitment stage, it's saying HR has taken an initiative to make some things happen. And by the way, we're committing to making this work. We've stated that. This is where we actually start doing something about it. And the ownership shifts from human resources or from the C-suite now to the leaders, yeah. the managers of the organization. They're held accountable for it. They act on it. They make things happen. We find that this is the largest leap for organizations is to move from commitment to management. The next step is what we call the integration stage. We find that uh, worldwide, only about 15% of the organizations are actually at this stage. Yeah. This is where engagement is prioritized. It, it is prized. It is very valued. We not only believe that this is a key strategic piece of what we do, but we're willing to measure people and integrate it into the organization. So we're holding people accountable for it. When we do 360-degree feedback, we're not only measuring their skills and abilities and behaviors, but one of the things we're measuring is whether or not they have the ability to engage people. Are they engaging leaders? Do they engage themselves and other people? That's the integration phase. I'll let you address this next one because it's one of those... <laughs> We don't see very many organizations. We don't. This. A very small percentage of, of this uh, organizations actually hit the the mastery level, or or even want to, for that matter. They exactly. recognize that that hitting mastery might not be in the cards for what they're trying to do, and that's okay. That's fine. And uh, and I think that that's critical to understand that you need to know where you are, and just because. It, 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 we have it in, you know, bottom to top, but really it's not the very best or at the top. Like you can still be a very, very good engaged organization and not be at the mastery exactly. level. And so it's, you know, I, I, I love when I talk to organizations about this and I hear the CEO say, well, I want to be at mastery. Five. I've yep. got to get there. That's right. But they're not always ready to get to that point. And, and, but part of that process is, okay, then how do we help you get there? And what are those commitments to make them do that? Really, what level of maturity do you want to get yeah. at? And if you want to get to management, fantastic. Let's, let's help you get there. Um, mastery, we find that of the hundreds of clients we work with every year, we may find one or two that actually hit that. Where the engagement of their organization is the key competitive advantage mm -hmm. that they face, yep. that they have. Let's go to the next section. All right, so that is what can the organization do? Now, remember, that's only 50% of the equation. Let's talk about where the other piece comes from. And we now have to look at engaging people in terms of managers and teams. What can they do? So the first question we have to ask is, what really is the manager's role in engagement? In this version of the book, we present some interesting findings, and we ask this question. So I went to our research team, our, our IO psychology team, and asked the question, I've been reading a lot about people joining companies but quitting managers. I believe this is fundamentally true. Give me some research to either support this or get away from it. So we started looking at all kinds of literature and started looking at our massive database as well. And we found some very interesting things. First of all, it's a fact. Yes, people join companies and quit managers. And there's a big but here. <laughs> all right. So we looked at 215 work groups. These work groups were very large work groups. So this involved a lot of people. And we measured the individual leaders' reported engagement and that team leader's level, that team's level of engagement. So you're my boss. We looked at your engagement. And then we looked at all of our team, you know, the nine people that may work for you. And we said, we'll look at Justin's engagement. Does it have any correlation to the rest of the team's engagement? Well, and this is what we report in the book here. Very clearly, yes. The answer is, as we look at the uh, left-hand side, 
This represents the employee engagement groups, percentage of the total, all right? And then on the bottom, it's the manager engagement group. So if, uh, first of all, this is the level of engagement as you, Justin, as a manager on the bottom, and fully engaged. So if you're fully engaged, then what happens is, as we look at these keys over here to the right, if you're a fully engaged manager, what percentage of your employees are likely to be fully engaged as well? And we find that there in the blue, if you're a fully engaged manager, you have a much higher probability of having a team that's fully engaged as well. If you're fully disengaged, you're not going to have very many fully engaged people that belong to your organization. Further, look at the number of fully disengaged people. So you're a fully engaged manager, meaning that you're an engaged individual. Mm -hmm. Look at the number of people who are fully disengaged in what they do. That's about 2 to 3%. Whereas if you're fully disengaged, you're going to be a lot closer to 9 to 10% of your employees are who are disengaged, disengaged in their work. So do you have an impact on engagement as a manager? Yeah, absolutely, very clearly. Here are our findings. The first finding was this. Engaged managers are more likely to have engaged employees. It's intuitive, right? Yep. But it's also been shown by research, and we show that in the book. The next finding. Simply being engaged as a manager doesn't directly impact engagement. So just the fact that you're engaged as a manager, there's a correlation between my engagement and yours, but it doesn't necessarily mean that just because you're engaged, I am engaged as well. Here's what we found. We found that engaged managers are much more likely to create environments in which employees choose to engage. Yeah. It's back to that team versus and the individual level and this is where the individual comes in i have to be able to create an environment at the organization i have to be as a manager be able to create an environment as well where others can learn and yeah. choose to become engaged and as a manager that is one of my core responsibilities is to ensure that that environment exists yeah you got it so the question comes and we've been asked this question also how long does it take to rise up this maturity continuum to hit mastery or integration the answer is it really depends on how willing you are to make it happen. Most of the time, it doesn't happen overnight. It doesn't happen in the first year. We have what we call engagement journeys. These engagement journeys may take three to five years to actually make that happen. And one of the reasons that is is because making the step to, in, it, to the manager piece of this is very difficult mm -hmm. for some organizations. The idea that, yes, this manager is an excellent operational performer, but her team's disengaged and therefore I'm not willing to act on it, that prohibits a lot of organizations from making that move or in, yeah. makes that in, inhibit. So let's look at this. Let's now move to the individual's piece. And this was fascinating. We added this to the new book. So who really owns engagement? Well, over a period of time. So when we looked at it 20 years ago, the employee used to own, the organ, used to own his or her engagement, right? Yep. If you're disengaged, that's your problem. Yep. Now that shifted to where we now believe that the organization owns engagement. And I don't like that shift because the engagement that I have, uh, the organization can only control 50% of that. I have to choose to engage. And we found some very interesting things. And we've seen organizations that think they own 100% of it. Exactly <laughs> right. right. That is, exactly right. That's where the whole perk thing comes in, that we just keep throwing different nap pods and taco Tuesdays and exactly all of right. that at our employees hoping that they will become engaged. You know, and it works to a certain extent. It helps you get up to, yep. say, the management level, yep. right? It really does, or the commitment level. But to get beyond that, we have to look at the employees. And often, it's almost to the point where employees now are saying, okay, uh, engage me. I yep. dare, I dare, I you, dare to you to engage me. <laughs> right? And the organization has a little bit of impact on that. Well, in fact, they have a lot of impact. But the employee has to choose to engage, and here's what we found. Less than 5% of disengaged employees move from disengaged to engaged while in that same organization. Wow. So what's the best option with these 5%? Help them find help another them, job. <laughs> help them disengage somewhere else. Exactly right. Yeah, you know, the kindness in us wants to say, well, we'll help you engage. The reality is, is only 5% will ever really engage if they're fully disengaged in the job. These are not our opportunity group, right? These, Correct. these are not our, our engaged employees. These are our fully disengaged employees. So what does that tell you about who owns engagement? Well, the employee owns a big part of this. 18% of employees who are disengaged in one organization engage in the next organization. So look at the, the opposite of this. Most employees who are disengaged in your organization will be disengaged in their next organization as well. 
we call this wherever the wherever you go, there you are mm-hmm. philosophy, right? It's that's who I am, and part of it is very, very personal, this engagement piece. Here's another one. Less than half of employees who attribute their disengagement to their boss. All right, so you are disengaged because I'm your boss. Well, when I'm replaced, less than half of employees like you will actually engage. So that tells you the problem wasn't necessarily the boss. Mm-hmm. It's the individual. It's more at the individual yeah. level. Or that boss has done so much dis, uh, disservice or problem in the organization that it just you can never recover. Learn helplessness. <laughs> There's a recent Harvard study that said that when an employee quits her job and is talked into staying, so you come to me and say, hey, I'm going to leave my job, and I say, Justin, I'll pay you 10% more, mm-hmm. and you stay, you'll probably leave within the next year anyway. Interesting. Huge probability. So what does all that say? It says that 50% of engagement is owned by the employee as well. Engagement truly is a 50-50 proposition. Unless we attack it at those three fronts, the organization level, the manager and team level, and the individual level, engagement's not going to increase. So Tracy, talk about that really quick. um, Because as an organization, you could say, well, this might be a little bit overwhelming because I've only been focused at the organization. Now, Now you're saying go at the team level, go at the individual level. How can I take the first steps of this? Not just you know bite, eat the whole elephant in one. Yeah. What might be a good first step in, in, in understanding how to approach it at the three different levels? Well, a big part of that is understanding where you're at in the maturity model, the continuum. You know, where do you want to be? And mm-hmm. if you want to move up that continuum, you need to understand that now I have to shift from just the organization to now being, being willing to bring in the managers as well. Yeah. So ask yourselves the question, if... Because there's, there's some pain in doing this. You may find some managers performing quite well operationally, but they're leaving a wake of dead in their path. <laughs> they really are. Seen a few of those. Yeah. In fact, our <laughs> studies pretty clearly show that those managers last about 16 months yeah. in an organization. And the reason they're, they, they're fired is because their operational performance goes down too because nobody wants to support them. So to answer your question, identify your, where you're at in that maturity model. And in order to move to the next level, it means you now move from engagement being owned by the organization or HR to now disseminating that engagement ownership Great. to, first of all, the managers, and then second of all, to the employees. And the book tells you a little bit more, tells you a lot about how to do that. That's great. The new book, uh, Engagement Magic, is actually being released on January 8th. Thanks again, Tracy, for being with us. Thanks, Justin. I appreciate it and invite you to certainly take a look at that book. If there's anything that we can do as an organization to support you in that journey, we'd love to do that. We love your reviews on the book, whether those be positive or negative. We want to understand whether this is resonating and how it's resonating. But choose to engage. Remember, engagement is a choice, and the choice is yours. Choose to make that happen. Great. Thank you all very much.